What else? Yes, favorite line. One line? Uh, I'll tell you where our favorite lines came in. And uh, both Terry and I started out in comedy writing prior to getting into dramatic writing. Uh, I worked the first two years at laugh uh, Terry did Don Adams screen tests and a bunch of other things. So uh, when, you, when you write on a dramatic show and you're always, uh, your brain is working toward this dramatic uh, progression of events and characters and so forth, you, you need some relief. And having been comedy writers for many years, we would always turn to each other and make some stupid joke, uh, given whatever the scene was that we were dealing with. We never put this in the script, but we would do it to ourselves and, or to each other. And uh, that's, those are probably my favorite lines that came out of Galactica. You never saw them in, a, in an episode, and they never went into a script. But, and I can't remember any of them. Probably good for you. Uh, that would be it. I, I don't. I don't personally remember any particular line that was, you know, um, real deeply philosophical or meaningful that that I can recall. But then I have a lousy memory, so maybe Terry. Can. Don't step in the Felger carb. <laughs> um, some a few anecdotes we, uh, that that I can think of that you might be interested in. Um, the Daggett. Oh. <laughs> um, it was originally called Muffet. And uh, then there was a, a, an issue that it's awfully close to Muppet, and there might be a legal problem. So he became Muffy the next week. Um, if you don't know, you probably do, it was a chimp in a costume. And um, the chimp's name was Evie, which is short for evolution. And Boone Nahr, um had trained this chimp. Animals don't like to be covered. And he trained Evie that this was a game put on the shoes and to put on the costume and the, the helmet, you know. The, the helmet was the hardest part. Yeah. Um, and uh, so this one afternoon we were down on the set and it was Noah Hathaway's birthday. And Evie was, was running around. Now Evie had a pet. She had this little Australian uh, sheepdog or shepherd, little black thing. It almost looks like it has no tail. And it would walk around with this dog on a leash. And it was the, the chimp's pet. And they had given uh, Evie a big jelly donut to, to eat. So the chimps got, you know, it's a party. You don't want to have a chimp with champagne or anything. <laughs> so the, the chimp's standing there with the dog and the jelly donut. And Boone looks down there and says, Evie, you share that donut with Skipper. And, he, and Evie looks up at him and looks down at the donut give Skipper some of that donut. And the chimp took a little tiny, little teeny tiny pinch and gave it to the dog. And as it was giving it to the dog, it crammed the entire rest of it in its mouth. It's hilarious. It, it, they did another, or Boone did another thing. Uh, one other day when we were out on the set, and again, there's always donuts on, on the set. If, if everybody doesn't scarf them up right away. And uh, he did the same thing. And it was a... Uh, a frosted donut, and he, he told Evie to give Skipper a bite, and Evie did the same thing, where she held it, she didn't want to do it, she said, come on, give Skipper a bite, so Evie held the frosting side out, because that's the way she was holding it, and the dog licked all the frosting off it, Evie looked at it and threw it all the way across the fence. <laughs> uh, somebody last night told me a funny story that I hadn't heard before, but I believe it. Um, apparently they were shooting a scene with the Daggett, and there was a lot of smoke. Um, but they hadn't rehearsed smoke, and uh, it was just supposed to apparently just waft across in this one particular sequence, and it came out real hot and heavy, and animals do not like smoke. Um, when the smoke cleared, there were four Daggett shoes on the floor, and the Daggett was up in the rafters, <laughs> in full costume. Um, what else can I tell you? That I remember um, walking down to the set, and, uh, and saying, uh, uh, for the very first time, we were introduced to, to Lorne. And uh, Lorne uh, got us kind of over in a corner, and he started rocking back and forth on his heels, like this, with his hands behind his back. And he says, now, I know that you can't give me every line, but 
what I want to say, whatever you write, I want it to be important. <laughs> so every time we saw Lauren, we would leave the set. We would go back to the office. We just didn't want to deal with that. Um, and one day we came in for lunch, and Lauren was sitting in her office. Yeah. And we had a, we had a deadline. We had to have the script uh, ready for prep the next morning. And we still had a good four to five hours to do on it. Um, and we came back to lunch and Lauren sitting in our office, and we thought he wanted to talk to us about something, and he did, but it was nothing in particular. And uh, he was regaling us with stories about uh, Bonanza and, and all these other things that have happened to him during his career. And it was immensely interesting. He was a very entertaining man and, and very sociable and nice when you got that close with him. But our problem was, how do you tell the star to get the hell out? you got to get this script done which we couldn't do, of course. So Lauren finally left about 5 or 5.30. We were there until about 3 in the morning uh, finishing the script. But again, uh, now that Lauren's gone, God bless him, it was a wonderful thing to have had that experience with him. Another Daggett story that you can see, actually, if you look real close in the Fire and Space episode. There's a sequence in the uh, when Boomer and the other uh, uh, Viper pilots are stuck in the... Uh, um, yeah, they're in the rejuvenation center, and then they move into, uh, like, a storage room. Okay. And I think that the, I think the Daggett has come in with the, the life mask at this point. Uh, somebody throws something on the floor. Something lands on the floor. If you look real closely, just before there's a cut, the Daggett, who... She thought it was something to eat. And she bends way down the floor to look at it to see if it's something to eat. You can see that and then it's a cut. But, you know, you've got to look real close. Um, you'll be interested maybe that uh, Murder on the Rising Star was written in 36 hours. We got to go on that script at uh, 4 o'clock on a Wednesday and it had to be in Mimeo at 7 o'clock on Friday morning. And I think that... Uh, we didn't go home. No. Well, what about uh, Take the Flux? Uh, Is that another one? Yeah, but that wasn't quite, we had like uh, a full week yeah. on that. Uh, well, what happened is we would uh, come up with story ideas, and of course, with Glenn being executive producer, he had the okay of the fall, and as did Don Belisario, the supervising producer. So we, we'd give this these story list, uh, and they were very brief, just like a paragraph telling what the story's about. We'd give them to Don, Don would immediately read them, make his selections, and then and Glenn. And in this particular case, we just, uh, did the script for 36 hours. Glenn would have to be away at the time. And uh, Don sent the list over to him, or phoned it to him, whatever it was. Got it to him immediately. And um, it, it took about 10 days to get an answer. And of course, then it was Wednesday, and we had to have it in on Friday. But uh, quite often, it was on a very short string in terms of uh, we would get the okay to go ahead, and all we had was a basic story idea. We hadn't even worked the story out yet because we didn't know which one they were going to select. So you can't very well work them all out. You'd be doing nothing but that and then throwing, you know, 90% of them away. So uh, most of the ones we did were done uh, in a relatively short period of time uh, relative to the usual amount of time you have to do an hour script. And uh, we ran on a lot of short sleep and things like that, but it was fun, of course. There was also something on uh, uh, Murder on the Rising Star. What was the name of that game that they were playing? With the with Triad, yeah. Um, they wanted us to come up with Triad. Uh, how, how was the game played? Well, the original concept was to make this um, huge plexiglass rectangle where they play basically basketball and weightlessness. So you can bank it off the ceiling and off the walls, and it, 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 someday they're going to be playing that. And you heard it here first. <laughs> it, you know, obviously it would have been cost prohibitive to, to come up with something like that. Yeah. Just another question. What do you think the chances are of a new publisher picking up and doing a series of Galactica novels? I would love it because they never did ours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're we're really not. Uh, closely associated with the uh, publishing end of the, of the business, so... It's up to you guys to, yeah. to write to somebody and say, hey, uh, you know... How many, how many novels were there, by the way? Like eight, nine? Fourteen? Did they do Fire in Space? 
Murder on the Rising Star? Yeah? Really? Oh. Take the Celestra, did they do that? No. Take the Celestra? Murder on the Rising Star? No. Yeah? Really? Interesting. They did that with the movie, too. They, uh... <laughs> uh, it, strange, strangely enough, it, it, according to Universal, it, it made a lot of money in, in the English-speaking countries around the world because there it showed in the theaters. And I, I think it was probably the, the, the draw of Galactica itself that, that did it. another uh, subsidiary character, uh, Athena. I was wondering, was there a conscious decision just to uh, pull the plug on that character uh, three quarters of the way through the season because it wasn't working, because there wasn't anything for her to do, or uh, talking about was there some other problem? Marin's character? Right. Yeah. Um, well, a couple things. Uh, Marin is basically a model. Uh, gorgeous, gorgeous lady and a lovely human being. Uh, very shy and didn't particularly care for acting because um, there's a lot of standing around and doing nothing you know while you're waiting and so forth and uh, her character was becoming less and less visible because by her own admission she wasn't that good at acting it wasn't that she was bad she just by you know all here she is with all of these other very professional actors with a lot of experience and and her lack of experience kind of showed and she was aware of that so she was a little bit embarrassed by it and the big thing was she uh, she was offered uh, a modeling job in uh, I don't know it was the Riviera or Con or somewhere I don't remember but it was it was a big job and and she felt that her career was really in modeling and so it was a a mutual decision on the part of the show and the network and her that she would prefer to be released so she could go take this modeling job and. Now, there may have been more beyond that, but I wasn't aware of it. That, that I was aware of. But she was, she was a lovely lady. We all, we all had to see her go. She was a sweetheart. Gentlemen, I'm sorry to jump in here, but oh. our time is up, and uh, we really want to thank you very much. Let's hear a round of applause.